Okay, so welcome to Transcendent Psychotherapist. I am joined by Addison Hodges Hart today, and we're going to be discussing a recent video uh, by Essentia Foundation about Carl Jung's book, Answer to Job, in which Jung sets out a uh, really quite a radically different view of God uh, than that espoused by uh, mainstream Christianity. And uh, obviously, Bernardo Castro um, is the CEO, major player of Essentia Foundation. Um, and his friend are really kind of pro uh, Jung's outlook here. And I know Addison uh, has written a substack recently kind of um, suggesting that it might not be the best uh, view of God. Um, and we're going to kind of explore that together. Um, before we dive into all of that, what we want to do perhaps is just introduce ourselves. So viewers that aren't familiar with either of us have some idea that we might be somewhat qualified to talk about, you know, what we're talking about. Um, so. Um, I'm basically a psychotherapist in the UK, hence my interest in Jung. Um, also got a, a theology degree um, from uh, Trinity St. David's, the University of Wales. And I'll let Addison uh, introduce himself. Yeah. Addison, would you mind just yeah, give us a bit of an idea of what you do, where you are, and, and so on? Okay. I'm Thanks. an American. I live in uh, Norway because I'm married to uh, an iconographer who is Norwegian. And uh, I'm a retired priest. Uh, I'm Anglican and um, uh, got my degrees in uh, theology, divinity, uh, and all of that over in the United States. Went to Harvard Divinity School and then after that to Trinity uh, Episcopal School for Ministry, which was my uh, seminary in the Episcopal Church. And I've uh, been living in Norway for the past, heavens, it's been 13. Teen, going on 14 years so wow. so uh, not that i can speak norwegian but i was gonna ask you yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but Thanks. that's about it i don't have much else to 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 tell uh, or, or else other things will come to light as we discuss maybe i don't know. yeah yeah I'm I've sure. written I've written eleven books, uh, and I have a Substack as uh, as you mentioned, Rob, uh, called the Pragmatic Mystic. Um, so, excellent, yes, and yeah. uh, we'll, we'll flag we'll flag that again at the end. And um, yeah, as you said, I mentioned any books that will undoubtedly come up as we go and kind of discuss things. So the, the pattern of what we're going to do is um, kind of show some clips from the video. Um, and I think it's worth us both, but worth saying is that both of us are actually, we, we appreciate Bernardo Castrop and work of the Essentia Foundation. Oh. Um, so I, this is not a kind of um, an attack on, on their work at all. It's really just kind of critiquing um, some of the ideas in that particular video. Um, what's your connection, Addison, to sort of Castrop's or your interest in, in Castrop's? Oh, I, 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 my, my interest is only that I've, uh, I've listened to him and yeah. uh, and read uh, uh, some of what he has written, uh, uh, most notably the, the book he did um, a couple years ago or a year ago on, uh, on Jung. Uh, I should add, why well, not only do I admire Castro, but I also admire Jung, and, and he's been very important mm. in my life. So anything I say... Um, not sounding terribly appreciative of either Castor or Young is has to be taken in uh, yeah. a relationship to the fact that I admire both both of them. And, uh, yeah. And so, but that's all, but but no, I I have no personal uh, connection to uh, uh, Bernardo Castro at all, except that I've enjoyed what he's turned out. Yeah. His oeuvre. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Okay. Um. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of work going on at the moment, I suppose, in the background, isn't there, on consciousness, which I guess Bernardo and Essentia are really pushing, you know, that you've got the whole question of, you know, um, can we explain human conscious experience through the material? And that's, I guess, for those not familiar with Castrat's work is the major kind of thrust that he's offering that alternative philosophy um, mm. and also grounding it in science as well. And I think that's of interest to you as well, Addison, isn't it? I, mean, I know there's a it's lot of work. It's an interest to me, but it's uh, even more so. Uh, my my younger brother is David Bentley Hart, uh, yeah, very well known theologian, and, uh, and and he's coming out. I think it's due out this coming year on uh, on consciousness. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, uh, he's also quite involved in discussions uh, uh, 
regarding the nature of consciousness and, and, yeah. and all that. So, yeah, I'd say uh, I'd say it's a concern for a lot of us. Uh, what 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 people are saying and thinking and, and writing about uh, this particular topic. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, um, without further ado, let's, let's jump it in. Um, so um, I guess answer to Job, is, you know, I've been listening to it on audible um, cause that's how I find my time a little bit, but um, yeah, yeah. And I guess um, it's worth just saying it for those that don't know it was Jung's I think favorite work um if you can call it his favorite it's written towards the end of his life um and that he he really saw it as perhaps a summary in some senses of his work or the of the pinnacle of his work at least that's my understanding um and I guess he's wrestling with the the problem of evil in a broad sense um not just with the kind of um, Old Testament figure of God of Yahweh, um, but the broader difficulty of the problem of evil, which for those listening who are not familiar with that is, I guess, essentially to say, you know, how come, how could we have, for example, a good, omniscient, omnipotent God in a universe or a world where there is also evil? Um, so that is the kind of backdrop. And I, I, I guess, I, I think <laughs> the book of Job is actually written in that vein to some extent as well um addison i wonder if you could give us a little bit of your a rundown from your point of view as to what the book of job is i mean like is it is it it's, it's a biblical book in the old testament but is it like a historical book there's this actual figure called job is it some sort of psychodrama um what, what, what is it and kind of what's it about would you say well, my understanding of my understanding of, of what, what Job is uh, first, if you take a look at where it appears in the uh, uh, the Jewish scriptures, uh, it is uh, it's it's in the writings. It's regarded as a as a book of wisdom. All right, so it's uh, it's a uh, it's a book that is intentionally provocative in, in nature. So when, when you read the book of Job, it's probably based on an older legend. Uh, Job is someone who lives in what's called the land of Uz, which is not to be confused with the land of Oz. But, but it's, uh, it, but, and so therefore he's, he's already, he's a, he's a Gentile, basically. He's, he's not mm -hmm. Jewish. Okay. Uh, and he's a wisdom figure. His name pops up, for example, in, um, uh, the book of Ezekiel uh, as one of uh, as a figure of great wisdom. So he's he's a legendary figure, and he is living in the story uh, a long, long time ago, if you will. You know, yeah. and if you look at the original story, what it basically was was the opening chapters and the concluding chapters. So, in all likelihood, the original book of Job or the original story of Job was a man who is tested, uh, loses everything, doesn't blame God, uh, and at the end receives everything back double. Okay, so there, there you have the old-fashioned, uh, uh, what we would think of as sort of the uh, conservative, pious, uh, teaching that if you uh, stay true to God, no matter how difficult it is when you go through trials, you'll come out okay in the end. All right. Uh, you mm -hmm. see the same kind of thinking in Psalm 137. You know, the, the mm -hmm. evil man gets his just reward, uh, which is evil consequences. The righteous man is rewarded by God. And that's that's conventional piety. But when we look at the book of Job, what do we find? We find everything that's in that conventional piety has been overturned by the middle section, which is this very long section of Job wrestling with his, uh, with his uh, physical problems, the loss of his family, loss of property, everything. And then he has uh, three and eventually four friends who drop by to basically tell him that he needs to confess his sin. And if he confesses his sin, then uh, and just admit the fact that everything that he's undergoing is the result of his own evil, then uh, everything will turn out OK. And that's that's the wisdom they impart. And Job, through the whole thing, is saying, no, but I didn't do anything. OK, I am mm -hmm. not I'm not responsible for having committed any kind of egregious act uh, offensive to God. 
And he stays true to that until God shows up at the end, uh, basically in a whirlwind, <laughs> a force of nature, to use Jung's actually uh, uh, perceptive comment. Uh, turns out he's a, he's a force of nature, and basically his comment to Job is, in effect, is, I'm God, you're not, so shut up. I mean, that's basically it. Now, the question is, what is the book of Job doing? Okay, and it's not written... Uh, intentionally to be a pious book, uh, like Jonah, uh, like um, Ecclesiastes. It's one of the problematic books, but it's only problematic because it's a case in Judaism, in the Hebrew mind, debate is, is something that, 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 that makes the religion thrive. Okay, so if you know anything about rabbis, uh, I remember years ago going to the University of Maryland and seeing the rabbinical students who were going into law school and they would stand outside and they would be arguing. You, you swear that they were going to start hitting each other, but they weren't. Yeah. This is this is a, this is how they uh, discuss <clears throat> the law. This is how they discuss religion. It's a debate. And if you understand that that's true of the of the rabbinical schools, you have to also understand it's true of what's going on in the Old Testament. That the entire Old Testament is an ongoing series of debates. So, for example, Jonah, very positive to Gentiles, in contrast to uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, very negative to Gentiles. That's a debate. Uh, Ruth, very positive to Gentiles, so much that you have a Moabitess of all things becoming the ancestor of David. And this is how the Jews worked out what they believed to be true about the God they believed had revealed himself. And so throughout this Old Testament, what you have is a series of debates in which the concept of God is being worked out. Is he more merciful to the Gentiles? Jonah says, absolutely yes. Even the Ninevites, the worst of all, uh, can be forgiven, all right? Which sets you up for the gospel uh, later on and when, when, uh, when we read that. So, so if you read the Old Testament correctly, it is, it is not the biography, a monolithic biography of God. What you have are many different views of God, all of them in competition, all about the same God. But there's a very big difference between the God you find in the earliest layers of the Old Testament. Say the God we find in some of the stories of Genesis, what we see in Judges, Joshua. And what we find much later on in the wisdom books, and I'm now including the Deuterocanonical books, books like Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, you know, books like that. So, you know, anyone who's reading that the Old Testament has to put Job into the middle of that. Job is not defending conventional piety. Uh, he's using a story, or the writer is using a story of conventional piety and then completely inverting it satirically from the inside and this and, and it takes a literary analysis to understand what's going on in Job. Uh, this is why I, it, it frustrates me you get somebody who's talking about it like it's a religious book uh, without doing literary analysis you know something that at least when I was going to university we took very seriously it was pre-postmodernism so we actually read the books very carefully, poetry very carefully. We're taught the difference between what's good, what's not, and also how to exegete, read out of the text, and therefore interpret the text uh, according to what's going on within the text. Um, and this is where um, Jung completely fails. He doesn't do that. It, it, it's, he doesn't do literary analysis. He uh, he assumes an awful lot, and therefore he misinterprets not only the Book of Job but virtually the entire Bible. So, yeah, no, wonderful. Love that. I love that summary. Uh, thank you. And it was like, I, I guess, because he had Protestant father, didn't he? His father was a Protestant minister, I think, in yeah. Switzerland. Um, and I'm kind of wondering as well. Like, you know, I, I remember like when I was younger, it's just suddenly dawning on me. Um, mm -hmm. looking, looking at the book of Job, um, oh man, because you know, being brought up in a Baptist church, sort of English fundamentalist church, a kind of benign, uh, fundamentalism, if you like, but just yeah. kind of suddenly, kind of, is um, there a benign fundamentalism? apparently, or? so, yeah. <laughs> um, and then suddenly realizing actually, or maybe this isn't a historical book, you know, maybe it's not like a literal figure, maybe there's something else going on here, and and I suddenly realized that, you know, this would be 
a great kind of work to st to put on stage. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I mean? it's, it's, uh, Job was put on stage uh, years ago. Uh, was it? It, was a, uh, play. it wasn't really Job, it was, uh, although I'm sure it's been done. But yeah. JB, uh, I don't know if you remember that. I can't, who was it? The author, uh, a famous playwright, but uh, but he yeah. did a play called JB and it was based on Job. Yeah. Okay. I had yeah. to read it in college when I was studying Job. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just, I think that's really a point well made that you've made there. You know, that just the very assumptions that you start with when you're coming to a text can completely reframe what you see. You know, it's like, you know, those old kind of uh, optical illusions where you, is it a woman in a, an old woman in a hat or is it, you know, and if you look at it long enough, and you suddenly see something completely different there. Mm -hmm. it's a rabbit or whatever it is those those illusions you know if you come at it with a certain set of assumptions you're going to kind of miss misread the whole thing um and that in a sense is what you're thinking jung jung's done in a way yeah yeah i think i think jung does it frankly i think it's it, i think it's simply because of the fact that he grew up and i know this will be taken the wrong way by by good and faithful protestants but when you divorce, it's something like G.K. Chesterton said, you know, I don't always quote G.K. Chesterton, but this was a good, he said, basically, the problem with the Reformation was that they took one piece of the church's furniture, meaning the Bible, and, and broke up all the pieces of furniture in the church with it, you know. Mm. Um, and I'm, I think uh, Jung's father, I believe, was Lutheran. I don't think it was the Reformed tradition, but... Right. Right. The problem is if you grow up with the idea of sola scriptura. Um, well, this is what Jung reflects when he when he is analyzing uh, God and and with Jung, of course, God is a psychological reality. Okay, it's not. Uh, mm. uh, he does he. he he recognizes that the Bible is at least is pointing to something greater than what's actually contained in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But when he approaches the Bible, uh, even though he, he really knows better, this is, the, this is one of the most frustrating aspects of reading that book. Jung had read enough medieval and patristic um, mm -hmm. theological writing in, of the past mm -hmm. to have been able to look at it differently than say a typical protestant sola scriptura approach yeah. and whether he's doing whether he does it unconsciously or consciously and i think it's a bit of both with young he approaches the bible as if it is one single book and the bible is not a single book the bible is a library as i mentioned earlier with competing views mm. even though they're all circling uh, one uh, uh, essential mm -hmm. concept. And Jung treats the, and so he approaches it almost in a classical biblicist Protestant way, which is surprising to me because yeah. Jung, I think, actually knew better than to do that. And we can talk a little later as we move on, but uh, he does the same thing with God. He completely ignores the apophatic tradition. He completely ignores the via negativa. And yet, this is a man who read Meister Eckhart, and mm. I don't, I don't get it. So, yeah, interesting. Okay, so um, thanks for that. I think that was a that's a really good setting of the stage, if you like. To I think for people that maybe know nothing of Job, and um, not everyone has a biblical background these days. You can't assume too much. So um, let's. Let's jump in. What I'm going to do is share a clip from um, the video. I'm going to share four in total. This is just the first one. And then um, we'll chew the card over that clip. So, limited okay. human experience where we are not omnipotent and omniscient, we can reach sort of a high level of consciousness, right? Because Job is very conscious of what, what's happening, whereas God is just in yeah this is right also instinct I, I i read a lot of and intuition yeah and everything preferable but we don't have to liberate that god if you want in us it will liberate itself in us so the self is looking for us at least as much as we are looking for ourselves that's beautiful yeah and that process 
um, is nowhere more visible than in working with the dreams. And what is very interesting is that the dream maker knows exactly which motive or theme for improvement is appropriate to put on the agenda at what stage of the individuation. You have never, you should never as an, as an analyst, be afraid that something coming of you, if you stick to the dreams properly, mm -hmm. and you don't run away with your own biases and hang up. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You never run the risk of bringing the patient to dangerous territory. It's always a very smooth ride. Mm. This is because it's guided by the self that exactly. it knows exactly what exactly. the patient is. Which is what God wants to incarnate in men. There's a, very, a bit of a short clip there, but basically, I guess they're talking clinically around um, Jung's idea of this capital S self. Um, mm -hmm. And that in doing the dream work, it got this idea that God is kind of outworking himself in man. This is Jung's idea and answer to Job, isn't it? That God is becoming conscious in man and kind of working and that's our job in therapy or our job is, as human beings to individuate, to unfold the, the deeper levels of the self so that the self, capital S, God, can become conscious, can become free um, in and through humanity. So just, yeah, I wondered if you, you had any, any thoughts on that. <laughs> well, I, I think, the, I think it, uh, it's, it's already starting on the wrong premise uh, because... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a there's a there's a part of me that wants to say yes, um, absolutely. Uh, God works uh, within us. Uh, certainly, that's. I mean, if you want to just use the Christian language, that's what we mean by the uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the the in breathing of God within us, which. Uh, in a sense, is so much a part of the self that it is transforming ourselves, you know, individually and collectively. So, yes, on the one level, we can say it's it's God at, at work in us. And when you say that, you're not saying anything that wasn't already said by St. Paul. Uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely uh, essential to Christianity to believe that, you know, that uh, uh, he is at work uh, within us. The problem is that within... Um, both uh, classical Christianity and I would say any of the of the uh, classical theistic beliefs is that you can't simply identify God with the self. Okay, mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, this this gets to what I was saying about the apophatic tradition. The, in the apophatic tradition we have to understand that anything that we say about ourselves is analogous to God at best, but that God in and of himself or God's self, he's unknowable. Uh, he, we, we cannot comprehend him. That means we cannot wrap our minds around him. Literally that's what comprehend means. We can't, we can't encompass what God is. Uh, in some ways, uh, Wittgenstein was was right at the end of the Tractatus. What we can't talk about, uh, we should just shut up, you know, and not talk about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Wittgenstein put God quite consciously in that category, you know. But this is but this is uh, this is something which uh, is uh, is is a central belief of Christianity that. Uh, I mean, even Calvin holds it. When Calvin, when Calvin refers to the Bible, um, and they and uh, and, uh, and he says this somewhere in the Institutes, uh, Calvin says uh, that God uh, speaks to us uh, with something like the mewlings of a of a of an infant. Uh, it, it's it's uh, to talk about God. Uh, this what, what the scriptures are. It's God's baby talk because we are incapable of understanding God unless he condescends to give us stories mm -hmm. and um, in a sense uh, parables and incitements to uh, to push on and know him uh, experientially. So what does that say? It says that God is 
not only within us, okay, and that's the imminence of God. We, we are aware that, that his, uh, or the, to use again, the Eastern Orthodox distinction between uh, God's essence and energies, if you will. God's energies are, are here. We, we live, move, and have our being in God. And yet, God is so utterly transcendent uh, that he is infinitely beyond our our, 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 our capacity to, to, to understand, much less articulate. Mm -hmm. And so we're given these intermediary things. Of course, the most, the most obvious intermediary thing for the Christian is the man, Jesus Christ, who for us becomes the human um, incarnation of God so that we see God with us, God as he is, if he's a human, then this is what God would be like. And mm -hmm. a step further, this is what God is like. He's like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, what I mean by all that, wrapping it all up, is um, when we start talking about God knowing God's self within our self and all of that, we have made him so imminent that we're no longer talking about the God that Christians believe in. Um, because that God is so transcendent that although he comprehends us, contains us and all creation within himself, mm -hmm. uh, we don't contain him. He doesn't have to come to any kind of self-knowledge. We as created, meaning partially nothingness, mm -hmm. right, is we are being brought out of a state of non-existence into infinite perfect existence. We're, mm -hmm. uh, to use Christian language, we are being deified or glorified. So. That's an infinite movement. Apectasy is the word for it in, in Christian theology. We are on a constant, infinite uh, movement from non-existence into a sharing in uh, God. Okay, hmm. who's beyond our comprehension? Where you know it's that you know the old oak tree and an acorn difference. You know we're the acorn. What we're going to be, we don't know yet. Paul talks like this. I mean, Paul's mm -hmm. constantly talking. You know, ultimately, God's going to be all in all. We don't have any idea what that even means. We just know that everything and God somehow are going to be uh, joined together in such a way that we are now fully living in that. But we're we're in, we're in the, we're evolving. We're in a we're in a process of of transformation, which begins for us with the resurrection. Now, that's a totally different concept than what they're talking about. It, it isn't God coming to know himself. It's mm -hmm. this nothingness that has become something which is becoming deified, growing into greater and greater comprehension of, of, of uh, the ultimate. Mm -hmm. And that's, Jung, Jung gets close to that sometimes, but, that, but that's not Jung. And, and when we start talking in, in those other terms, that uh, somehow the self capital S, or even when we talk about the uh, the collective unconscious being somehow the same as God, uh, yes and no. Uh, mm -hmm. It it participates in God, but to uh, equate it with God is a serious category error for the Christian theologian. That uh, no, that 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 simply can't be true and it doesn't work and if that's the case then uh all of christianity and in fact uh everything like neoplatonism uh, to you know mystical judaism or sufism or whatever all of it um they're on all on the wrong track yeah <laughs> just that's not how they see god at all yeah and uh, yeah thanks uh, i think that that the sense i got because i was reading like the beginning was it the, the intro, uh, Jung's introduction to answer to Job, um, and he kind of sort of says, that, you know, the, the, like the the God image. Of course, of like for him, the, you've got the archetypal image, but you've also got the archetypes that lie behind the archetypal images. So the archetypes generate the images that we get in the dreams. You know, so he talks about, I guess, the self, the capital S self, or or, or the you know the divine for Jung would be a kind of archetype, and therefore, as you said kind of sits within the collective unconscious um and for those not familiar at all with Jung I guess um we perhaps ought to explain what the collective unconscious is so that I guess 
and for Castrop as well, he sees the whole of reality ultimately is psychic. And, and Castrop makes the case that Jung actually, although he hid it in his earlier career, was actually a kind of probably approaching something like a all his consciousness monist ultimately, although he probably tried to he wanted scientific respectability so he, he dumbed that down early on but you know the collective unconscious so you've got the kind of uh, our ego self which is you and i when well, we talk about me isn't it i guess addison you know we're talking about me now uh, mm. the sense of the story of who i am the story of who addison is etc and then we've got the collective unconscious which is the, well the personal unconscious which is our if you go down through layers i've got the ego and the personal un, personal unconscious which is uh, what Freud might have talked about in terms of just that aspects of ourselves that are not the conscious mind, but are ideas that we might come across to some extent in dreams and so forth, so forth that push the conscious mind. But beneath that, you've got this other level as well of the collective unconscious in which we're all kind of within the stream of uh, ideas and archetypes that run through the whole of humanity. Um, probably nature, Castrop would say. Uh, Castrop, um, you know, he likens that to what he calls mind at large. And that links then to what you were saying, you know, that this idea of the collective unconscious for Castrop being equivalent to God, that God could reside at that level of reality, the collective unconscious. But it was interesting because also in, in that um, introduction to answer to Job, he kind of says, well, the god images and are there in the collective unconscious and but they make manifest a deeper level of the divine which is unknowable and i thought well that's interesting because at some level he's sort of aware of what you're saying yeah. that there is a deeper level of the divine which is beyond this kind of collective unconscious level mm -hmm. um but it, i i can't help but feel it gets confused um, yeah, I, 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 well, I think with with all due respect to to, to Bernardo uh, Castro, mm. uh, he's not a theologian, and mm. uh, and he might be the kind I don't know if he is or not. Sort of dismiss theology as being uh, of any great um, having any great weight, but I think in doing so, if if he were the kind to do that, it would mean that he just needs to be better read because mm. uh, theologians are not that easily dismissed as intellects. Uh, some of the greatest minds of all time have been theologians. So uh, he, would, he would do well, um, in my estimation, he would do well to pick up, I don't know, any number of theologians. I could, I could, I could send him a list if he was interested of the people he should be reading, you know, but, mm. uh, but, um, but he's not a theologian, and so I think he does get confused. And, and when he makes, I, I guess it's coming up in a clip where he makes uh, the statement that this could save Christianity, mm -hmm. all he does is tip his hand that he's not a theologian because it's, it's almost an absurdity to make that claim about, about uh, Jung's answer to Job. Uh, that, that has absolutely nothing to offer uh, in the way of saving Christianity. Um, <laughs> And it's only a northern white European <laughs> of the first world <laughs> could make a claim like that, <laughs> you know, and because it, it, it suggests that Christianity is in need of saving, which uh, which is true maybe up in, in the northern hemisphere and right. Western yeah. culture, but it ain't true yeah. most places on the globe. So. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Kastroff, I mean, I think he's written books like, as, um, what's it, More Than Allegory and rationalist faith or so no uh, rationalist spirituality so he d dips his toe i think uh, i think i think if he was here here um to be fair to him i guess if he was here in this conversation he'd probably say he has great respect for a lot of religious traditions and theology and theology. Oh, sure. but i think he'd admit he's not a theologian though and yeah, yeah i think you're quite right and i think you know it's just knowing your limits and i suspect hopefully he he, he probably does to some extent but and, and well, for I, me I, I think again. I think he. I think he's a great guy. From what yeah. I gather, he is. He's a wonderful person and would be a delight to sit down and talk with. So, yeah, no animosity for me on this side. I just. I just know yeah. that. It, it, where I mean, look, there's tons of stuff he can talk about, and I'm clueless what what he's talking about. But when you get on this subject, I do know something. 
yeah. you know, and, and I can say, uh, Bernardo, there's there's some there's some stuff out there you need to be more familiar with. And so, yeah. When I say that, me, humility. Yeah, no, and for me, the big issue, and we'll come on to this maybe a bit later when we look at this kind of idea of the Hegelian, Hegelian evolution of God, which they both talk about, you know, this... Um, I know your brother as well. David's talked about this to some extent. Um, was it the doors of not doors of the sea, the beauty of the infinite as well? The Hegelian aspect, you know, that that God can't simply be a, a, um, an entity of becoming, but has to be the very source of all right. being and becoming, um, which comes back to that kind of Neoplatonism you're talking about. You know, like the idea of the one, the apophatic God. You know, if, if God is just becoming, then and we'll probably get onto that and perhaps talk about process theology or open theism or something like that. Maybe touch on that, but you, you then you run into problems because you've, yeah, we'll, we'll come on to that later on. But yeah, you can't ground it. Basically, it seems to me. Yeah, um, yeah. John Milbank and um, I think your brother were talking at one point about how it kind of leads the road open to a kind of fascism almost because. Yeah. yeah you've got kind of just sheer becoming sheer centers of power in that Nietzschean sense uh, as well the, the truth the truth is if you're going to if you're going to find any validity in Hegel and and I and I have to say that uh, mm. I'm not terribly well read in Hegel I don't uh, but uh, mm. but but my brother is better uh, with Hegel than I am mm. um, but in my opinion it simply doesn't apply to God it, it, it you can no more apply any theory Hegel's or anyone else's like that to God and and ultimately make any sense of it. it it's it's going to fall apart at some point if we're talking about the God of um, you know uh, of uh, say orthodoxy or Catholicism whatever you know uh, and I'm talking about the serious mm. Christian uh, classical theology. Um, you know, Hegel just doesn't enter into that. Uh, he thought he was a good Christian, by the way, apparently, although there's debate on that, too. So. Yeah, 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 absolutely. OK, should we jump into the next clip, Patterson? Um, yeah, sure, sure. I think you've alluded to it earlier. Was that This is the one about um, uh, uh, Answer to Job being the book to save Christianity. Um, yeah. So let's let's have a watch and see what we think. Though your average mainstream Christian would really think this book is blasphemy, blasphemy it, is, it is this book that can save Christianity in a sense. And I mean that, of course, of course. Bernardo. If you have the eyes to see, this is the book that will save Christianity. Regrettably, that will never be seen by, by the Pope or no, no, the ecclesiastical no, no. authorities. It's, 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 they're invested, of course, yeah. in a worldview, yeah. in a paradigm. Yeah. A, a Christian reboot is both terribly needed and practically an impossibility. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the tragedy of our times. And you just refer to yourself as an ex-Christian. That's yeah, actually the first time I say it like that. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, I, I noticed it. I, I, I thought it was remarkable. Yeah, it is. If you ask me, I, are you a I, Christian? I would tell you yes. No, that's funny. Yeah. Culturally, of course. And by upbringing, of course. But... I say it because I don't want to be associated with doctrine that with I the can, nonsense. with the bullshit. Yeah, yeah, and there's yeah, that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, when you say Christian, people have an image of mainstream Christian. If I could say the nuanced, could say I'm a Gnostic Christian, I, that, that's that's way better. A, a, a Gnosticism, that's more. Then I could say, okay, I'm Christian in that sense. But I mean, that's a nuance people don't understand. So then I'm just saying now, but you're right. I think the Vatican is not Christian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we talk. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what can I say? I mean, it's, uh, you know, Christianity has uh, has uh, uh, not always uh, shown itself to be uh, uh, in, in, in uh, good shape. And uh, we know this, uh, if you, you know, it doesn't matter which uh, branch of uh, Christianity we talk about. <clears throat> it's got its problems. And uh, but to say, oh, I don't think the Vatican is Christian and all this kind of thing. Well, you know what? Uh, I'm not a Roman Catholic, so uh, it's not for me to say. And uh, one way or the other, I think Pope Francis is a Christian. I think he tries very, uh, very well to uh, to live up to the uh, to the standards that he uh, 
that he preaches. So I don't, I don't really see um, this kind of commentary as being anything except the usual um, sort of secularist um, stuff that, that we hear all the time. And it's yeah. kind of tiresome, really. It, it, it's just kind of boring. At, at the end of the day, you know, somebody has dipped their toe into Christianity. They've run into um, uh, maybe a, a very facile, very um, uh, biblicist, uh, maybe dogmatic in the worst sense, you know, whatever it is. And they're reacting against it or they're turned off quite rightly so <clears throat> by the uh, by the things that we all see in the news you know whether mm -hmm. it's uh, whether it's uh, pedophilia among clergy uh, that has not been dealt with uh, properly whether it's uh, um, the uh, uh, you know the russian orthodox blessing uh, uh, an invasion <clears throat> of, of of ukraine you know you can go down the list of, of all the things that that can make people uh, be uh, less than enchanted with with uh, with christianity and uh, and religion at its worst is something always to be uh, is always to be uh, uh, decried uh, because religion, uh, the word itself, perfectly fine word, just means what it is you're bound to. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you become an institution that's self-protective and uh, uh, rigid and harmful of others, of course, you're going to have people who turn their backs on it. So none of that surprises me. What I would argue with is that there is, you know, if you're going to reboot Christianity it was a stupid term. I, I'm sorry that he used it uh, because all I can think about is rebooting Doctor Who or something, you know, on that level, you know, rebooting the Incredible Hulk. Um, <laughs> and I, I just hate that kind of terminology. It's like talking about, you know, um, you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, you just, uh, you know, let's talk like adults now. Uh, if you're going, if but if you're going to reboot Christianity, what has to be rediscovered is its own tradition, and that's what's not been taught. What hasn't been taught is that we have this incredibly rich um, uh, theology and spirituality, uh, which is one of the reasons I write the Pragmatic Mystic. You know, um, not that I get very deep there, but the truth is, is there are there's layer upon layer upon layer that is rich, deep, profound, life altering. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe very sincerely that Jesus Christ is risen and alive and active and knowable, and that we can uh, experience um, uh, the reality of God. And I'm not denying <clears throat> the validity of other religions, what I'm saying. And I'm just saying in my own tradition, which is Christian, mm -hmm. if you go deeply into it, if you if you go back to the, uh, the liturgies, uh, if you uh, take into yourself the teachings of books like the Philokalia and, and uh, uh, the great mystics, the great saints and spiritual writings, the church fathers, the desert fathers, the desert mothers, you know, whoever it is, Mother Teresa or not Mother Teresa, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, anybody who really goes into the heart and soul and mind of Christianity. That's what needs to be rebooted, and that is its own mysticism. It gets back to that very famous quote of Karl Rahner, mm -hmm. that the Christian of the future will either be a mystic or will cease to exist. The one thing I can honestly say is that if you try to substitute answer to Job for, for genuine spirituality, it's just, it's just silly, because there is more, I'll say there's, there is more profundity in, say, one page of the Philokalia, uh, you know, this uh, five, five volume. Uh, oh, work of, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. you got yours too. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's more, there's more profound and enriching truth in just one page of that than you're going to find in anything. In fact, probably in, in one saying that you're going to find in the entirety of the answer to Job. And to think that we're sitting on top of all these resources. I mean, I'm surrounded by it. I got a mm. library of it. And I'm going to actually turn to the answer to Job. I mean, yeah. you know, 
how ridiculous is this? You know, I, I read it and I almost threw it across the room and I was thinking, you know, look, <laughs> Carl, Carl, mm -hmm. for heaven's sakes, you did a good job with uh, Modern Man in Search of a Soul. Why did you mm -hmm. write this? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. you know, well, he's writing it out of, uh, he's, he was he was writing it out of his own pain. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a problem with his father's uh, lack of faith. He's trying basically to heal a psychic wound in his father, trying to, um, in a sense, find an answer that he could no longer give to his father because his father had died. It was a, it was a hurt in his own life. Of course, he felt this was therapeutic and healing to himself. Yeah. But it was only healing to him, like the Red Book. I mean, really, I mean, why, why, you know, the Red, people love the Red Book, but why was it published? Because it was not for everybody. It was, it was, it was uh, yeah. Jung working through his own mm -hmm. therapy. Yes. And that's and both both books are good for that. I'm I'm sure that helped him to get all that out on paper. What it's not helpful is for anybody who's actually looking for rebooting uh, their spiritual life. Uh, it, it is uh, it, I would say go find a real spiritual director who knows the wealth of our heritage, and that's where you're going to find the living reality. Yeah, be there in Carl Jung's book. I'm sorry, it just isn't. If anything, if that's uh, that's uh, hmm. it, it's it's a sad and pathetic alternative, so, and that's being charitable. And it's interesting, Addison, because I, I know enough of your work to know that you're a broad kind of um, you have a broad spirituality in the sense that you, I know you're deeply interested in like Taoism and so forth as well, aren't you? So. Um, well, yeah, just in so, case anybody yeah. listening to this is thinking, oh, these two are kind of like, you know, just going, ah, Christian, it's just Christianity. or, But, but yeah, you, you you know, that's your primary tradition, but you draw, I know, quite richly from yeah. from other faiths. So I um, just wanted to put Oh, that. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm fast. Yeah. I've, I've been deeply uh, read in Taoist and Zen, mm -hmm. uh, Zen Chan writings, um, uh, Sufism, things like this. All of those I have found have contributed very much to to my understanding of of, uh, of spirituality and, and all that, but but um, but yeah, no, I stay true to my own tradition and, and yeah. believe in the truth of it. Uh, but yeah. I just think that God's at work on a <laughs> much broader scale than than many of us would like to think yeah. he is. Yeah, and I got the same impression as you. I, I was listening because I was listening to it at the Audible book uh, of, um, and the, obviously it wasn't him reading it, which would be difficult. But um, the, the guy reading it captured the sarcasm. It was the sarcasm that hit me just over and over and over again. You know, this um, almost treating Yahweh as if Yahweh was this literal character, rather. And that's the question I was going to ask you. Actually, I'll come to that in a second. But you know, um, just it kind of felt in places interesting and other places kind of an immature rant in play. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think that embarrassed me the most about reading the mm. book because I, 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 I felt that Jung was just that it was, it was, it was somewhat immature. Uh, it, yeah. it, it, it was the hurt child in him is what I see it as, uh, it, which he describes beautifully in his, in his autobiographical writings. He tells you how much pain he felt. Mm. over this and when you read it in light of that that pain is coming through answer to job but it's his own pain it's his pain it's not yeah. my pain <laughs> so, yeah. i can sympathize with it but i can't take it on board as being of any real help to me you know yeah i mean so circling back a second in terms of i mean the question i was going to ask you is do you think in some senses jung has confused for example like the old testament like the Book of Job in particular, confused the notion of there be you know this being something within a debate within a community where you have the evolution of ideas about God, and he's confused that with an evolution of God. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a very good insight. Uh, what you mm. just said, uh, yes, that's exactly what he's done. He's he 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 thinks that what he's looking at is it's almost like this is the main character of this book. You know, you know, it's you know, um, the main character of, of a Christmas Carol is, is Ebenezer Scrooge, and the main character of the Bible is is Yahweh God. And here we have young Yahweh, 
still trying to figure things out and now here's older Yahweh and now here's Yahweh coming to terms with, with what a what a klutz he's been and, and how bad he's been and now here's Yahweh making amends and here's Yahweh facing at the end that some of his old bad habits are coming back in the book of Revelation. But you know, so you get this, you know, here's the biography of God. Which isn't again, isn't at all what the Bible is. The Bible, the Bible uh, is is a very. I mean, a, 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 a just one tiny, tiny example of just how badly botched uh, Jung's book is. He uh, he he reads First John. God is love, and you know God is you know He dwells in unapproachable light. That's in First Timothy, and, and God is love and all that. And then he and then but then along comes the shadow again in the book of revelation and, and what he's doing is he's assuming that the writer of first john is, is the writer of revelation yeah. and now we've got angry yahweh has returned and so the old shadow has come back we always got to worry about that shadow coming back he said this is young's point mm-hmm. well the problem yeah, is, as well. yeah. is that any biblical scholar even in 1952 when he wrote the book yeah i was going to wonder whether they would have yeah yeah back then as well they're not saying the same thing. I mean, it's it's yeah. two entirely different authors, you know, and, and so so he's he's not even paying attention to the biblical criticism of his own period. And so anyway, very frustrating to read the book because <clears throat> I, I just wish I could reach into the book and grab out Carl and say, Carl, let's go have a walk and talk <laughs> yeah. about the Bible. Right, yeah. you, you clearly don't get it. Hmm. Um, you think you're psychological analyzing the main character of a story. <laughs> yeah. It's, there's a lot more there than, than what you're yeah. giving us. I'm just mindful of time. I think rather than showing more clips, just perhaps we might come to, I don't know how long you've got, Addison, how long you're happy. Yeah. need me. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. I'm thinking perhaps we ought to move on to like, you know, this thing, we've touched on it, you know, the incarnation and the atonement, which is kind of two big themes, aren't they, within um, Answer to Job. Um, and I know Castrap, I could show the clip, but we, we can just talk about it. But they talk about, you know, um, Castrap and his friend talk about, you know, the, the idea within Answer to Job is that we're switching out from this idea of, you know, in Jesus, him dying for man's sins, it becomes in Jesus, Jesus is dying for God's sins. That, that God is this kind of un, unconscious Yahweh infant, almost like you just described, you know, who's now becoming aware in that confrontation with Job that he's not got the integrity of Job. He's becoming more conscious in his encounter and clash with Job. And he suddenly, suddenly gets this idea of, oh, well, maybe I should incarnate and I could learn something. And, you know, um, so, yeah. And then then we get the, we'll, we'll, come, we'll separate the atonement maybe from the incarnation for a minute, but yeah. What do you think of his idea of the incarnation there? I mean, I, yeah. well, <laughs> not much. <laughs> the whole, the whole idea that God becomes incarnate so that he can, he can taste, uh, you know, what it is to be human and therefore learn to be empathetic and all this kind of thing uh, is, is completely out of, you know, nobody reads the New Testament that way. And, and, and it took Carl Jung to come along and read it and suddenly come up with this idea. Um, and part of the problem is he puts this uh, propitiatory sacrificial theology right at the heart of things. And um, I think as any Eastern Orthodox, I'm not, I'm Anglican, but as any Eastern Orthodox theologian would tell you, that that's a very Western idea. And it, obviously, for Jung, it's important. If he comes out of the Lutheran background, um, of course, that's center uh, centerpiece for him. But it's not for um, the vast majority of the church fathers, and uh, certainly not the most ancient tradition. It's it's a, it's a vitally important part because Jesus died, you know, and he died terribly on the cross. But they're much more focused on the glory of the resurrection. The uh, you know, uh, the ascended Lord, the gift of the spirit, you read the new Testament and that's where the real weight is, is on those things. And the understanding of God that we have, again, remember the old Testament, it's a, it's a progressive revelation. So when you get to the new Testament, it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus 
uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, he stands there and he says, well, you heard it said an old time, but I say to you, and he, 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 uh, he puts that right next to, you know, uh, the law is very important. He says, you know, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets, uh, not to destroy it, but here are some of the things that you have to understand. They didn't understand it all that well. And now I've come to tell you, it's not just you shouldn't murder people, but you should shouldn't hate them either, you know. And uh, and so he, what he basically does is then gives us a, a picture of, of God as it's been completely refined, not just redefined, but refined by him. It's the same God, but now this is God as Father. This is God as the one who uh, gives generously to the good and the bad, the just and the unjust, the, the sunlight and the rainfall and all that. Mm. And um, what we have to understand about uh, the New Testament point, again, uh, the point of the, the Christian revelation, which I don't think is very well expressed uh, by many at all, is that we are uh, creatures who are, in a sense, half-baked. You know, this is why evil exists, is because we are being drawn even now out of a state of non-existence, nothingness, bestiality, uh, into we're animals that have been given, in a sense, uh, the likeness of God. And we are being constantly drawn into um, a greater and greater state of being. You know, so that the goal of Christianity is to partake of the divine nature, as it says in Second Peter one four, or to be uh, transformed into the image of the Son through the Holy Spirit, Second Corinthians three eighteen, um, and uh, or as John says, First John chapter three verse two, I think it is, where he says, uh, "When we see Him, God, we will be like Him." You know. So that's ultimately what we are. We're, we're in a progression. And so, of course, we, what do we call sin? Sin is, uh, the word sin itself simply means, hamartia, to go off course. It's, you know, it's like you're shooting an arrow and it misses the bullseye. Uh, it goes, uh, it overshoots or goes sideways or something. Uh, and the whole point is, is to get us back moving in the direction of the transformation, which is actually not just part of our creation, but also what we mean by rebirth and recreation. So uh, this is the Christian hope. Now, obviously, it's a matter of faith, you know, and hope and, and charity, but it's it's a matter of faith. Either, either we believe that that's this is why, I, you know, you can't sit down maybe with a Bernardo Castro and say, well, you have to believe this. Uh, because he's a man of science. And so he's going to say, well, you know, give me the proof or, you know, this isn't what the material. The Christian doesn't begin there. The Christian says, I've had some kind, and most Christians have at some level at some point, they've had an encounter, which they don't maybe talk about quite, but they know somehow that this God is real. Um, and I would say that's felt in, in a lot of traditions, not just within Christianity. The whole the whole idea that uh, when we talk about Taoism and uh, Advaita Vedanta and, and all of these, it, these are people who have had an experience of the transcendent, which is really what a mystic is. It's an intuition that there's something greater towards which I'm being drawn, and that has a transforming or transfigurative power mm -hmm. that begins to work from within, mm -hmm. but that has an ultimate um, has an ultimate source and an ultimate end that this life participates in but isn't but isn't uh, the entirety of and that's what christianity is and we've done a pretty poor job i think i think if you go to your typical sunday morning service uh you'll be you will be very very uh lucky if you get someone who can somehow transmit that to you from the pulpit in a way that that you go, wow! I never understood that that mm. way before, and that's what's lacking, and that's what the reboot is. As for what the incarnation is, that's God entering into the human condition, and I believe, of course, well, just like the uh, the Eastern Fathers, that it is through that uh, resurrection of Christ 
okay, planting the seed in the heart of the creation, in the heart of humanity, that will work its way out like a like like the kingdom is like a seed. It will work its way out into uh, our transformation, and so through that comes our rebirth, comes the work of the Spirit in us, and it it does transform us. That's the whole idea. Uh, we are being transfigured into the image of the Son and into deification, and the resurrection is, if you will, that's what uh, that's what begins the regeneration of us and the cosmos and everything else it's a matter of faith and uh, and so that's that's where i would come down if, if you're gonna say what is the incarnation so do i see the incarnation god trying to save god i think that's absurd it's god perfecting his creation so that as it says in first corinthians 15 god will be all in all it's it's the, an at atonement coming to that the word means at one meant and we're not talking now just about sacrifice we're talking about all of creation and god being joined together at one at yeah. one atonement so that's what i believe and um, and uh, so when i hear say the old, i don't i don't think jung is being quote unquote blasphemous i don't think he intended to be blasphemous i read jung and i I don't sit around and point the fingers. Oh, blasphemy, you know, like I'm horrified. I just think the poor man just didn't know enough mm. at this point to address adequately something he should have known much more in, in order to do so. So he, he fails as a literary analyst where Job is concerned. He doesn't add anything to metaphysics or theology. In spirituality, it's it's disastrous. Uh, it's just not a spirituality anybody can can take seriously and and have any kind of transformation. If I'm if I'm totally worried about God's transformation, then I'm I'm off the hook, aren't I? I don't I don't have to deal with my own failures or sins or anything else. I can blame God. It's so much easier. That's interesting point. That's a really interesting point, Addison. I hadn't thought that. Yeah, because in a sense, I was looking at. Because he, 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 parts of the book, he's almost like he's saying Yahweh is like projecting his unconscious material that he he's unaware of, or something we see quite a lot in psychotherapy. You know, when people are unaware of something, they're not. They're, you often experience it as a therapist. It comes out in the work, or you you get a whole set of feelings that are different. You're thinking, where's that coming from? Why am I suddenly feeling angry now? Why am I, you know, I've got no reason to be. Maybe this is coming from the from the patient. Mm. And often it turns out it is, you know. So Jung's kind of got this idea that Yahweh is projecting onto man when he, when he, and onto Job when he says, "Who is this that darkens my counsel without understanding?" You know, mm. and you know it's actually well, it's actually Yahweh that doesn't have any understanding, that doesn't have the insight and the consciousness. But it's interesting that you put it the other way around. There, it's kind of actually well, maybe there's something going on with Jung that he's projecting onto mm. the divine canvas. What's going on for him? I think the whole book is is young projecting. I I, I read it exactly like that. I, I read what he was saying, and then I thought, no, it's the other way around entirely. Yeah. All yeah, the yeah. Great. Okay, I, we've just gone over the hour mark. I, I think that's probably a wonderful spot to to stop there. Unless there was anything else you wanted to to to, to raise, Addison. Not really. Just to say thanks. I, I appreciate yeah. it. it was a, delightful discussion i'm glad i could get it all out of my system you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah likewise T totally enjoyed it uh, it was really good it was and it just lovely as well for me just to get the chance uh, i'm a terrible book jumper so i will start a book and then move into another book and then come back to that you book don't need years, to finish so. it you get the gist it's <laughs> yeah it's not yeah. going to get any better <laughs> no 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 but this, this forced me to actually finish the book so that was good yeah. and, yes that was great and really good to connect with you we've connected before on facebook so I um, feel like I know you a little bit better as well now. So, um, yeah, thank you for your time. And um, well, thank you. yes, we'll speak again. Oh, and where can people, before we go, where can people find you, um, Addison? So you mentioned Pragmatic oh. Mystic earlier and some of your books. Uh, this, well, the Substack, of course, is mm -hmm. uh, is just look up the Pragmatic Mystic or mm -hmm. my name, Addison Hodges Hart, and it, it should come up. And, um, and uh, I have 11 books in print. Um, 
Nine of them are spirituality. Two of them are fiction. The last one is a book of ghost stories. And I'm very proud of that one. I, I like ghost stories and I wrote 11. Yeah. I read one of yours once. I, I was, a, was a person in the, uh, oh, what was it? They bought this house somewhere. I can't remember what, what the name of it was now. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, right. It's the one I put on my Substack page. It was the, f the free one I gave. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was good. I enjoyed it. Yeah, so I yeah, entirely Henry, recommend Henry. it. That was the name of it, Henry. That was just, Henry. That okay. was just the name, yes. So, yeah, no, I enjoyed that. It was based on a dream I had, a very weird dream, and I just thought, well, I, it makes great ghost story material. Wow. You know, some people don't like nightmares. I, I don't mind them because it gives me grist. Yeah. <laughs> <for the> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll resist the temptation to get into analysing that. So uh, we've had enough of you. Yeah. <laughs> Are you cheap? I hope. <laughs> yeah, cheap, cheap enough. Yeah. I need it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Addison. Well, amazing. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Sounds good. God bless. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.